Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on direct air capture. This webinar is organized by the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University in Washington, D.C. The Institute is a research center that focuses on the social, legal, ethical, and political implications of carbon removal. I'm David Morrow, the Institute's Director of Research and the moderator for today's webinar. For anyone who's new to this topic, carbon removal is the process of capturing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and locking it away, usually for, for decades, centuries, or longer. And as a supplement to cutting greenhouse gas emissions, carbon removal could help reduce climate change. Today's webinar is part of a series on different technologies and practices for implementing carbon removal, and you can find the whole series on the Institute's YouTube channel and on our website, carbonremoval.info. Today's webinar is going to explore a variety of technologies for and uses of direct air capture, including but not limited to carbon removal uh, via direct air capture and carbon storage. I'm very pleased to welcome three experts on direct air capture today. Jen Wilcox, who is James H. Manning Chaired Professor of Chemical Engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. Christoph Beutler, who is Carbon Dioxide Removal Manager at Climeworks in Switzerland. And Sahag Voskian, who was recently at MIT and has since become co-founder and Chief Technology Officer of Verdox in Massachusetts. We're going to handle all present all questions at the end of the three presentations. If you'd like to ask a question, please type your question into the chat box, and I will moderate those questions once the presentations are finished. And now over to Jen Wilcox. And I should be sharing my screen. Can everybody see that okay? Okay, thumbs up. All right. So I'm going to give an introduction uh, to direct air capture, but I'm going to first start by just being a little bit more broad and talk about negative emissions in general and emphasize the fact that direct air capture is one of a portfolio of solutions that involve removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And I'll start with just this, this front slide. Uh, there was a recent National Academy of Sciences report that was released in January uh, last year. And the charge of that group was to come up with a research agenda for this space for negative emissions uh, in general. And one of the major conclusions from the study that is, is as follows. If the goals for climate and economic growth are to be achieved, negative emissions technologies will likely need to play a large role in mitigating climate change by removing globally 10 gigatons of CO2 per year by mid-century and 20 gigatons of CO2 per year by the century's end. So these are pretty significant targets. Again, there, there should be a distinction between avoiding carbon emissions in the first place versus removing CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And these are targets associated with removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, just broadly speaking, there's a number of technologies we focused uh, on these in that report where we looked at establishing a research agenda. So if you're interested, you can find more um, at this link. And we have a chapter really associated with each of these uh, technologies, and uh, which we're kind of broadly calling them negative emissions technologies. And so we look at uh, weathering of rocks, so looking at alkalinity in the Earth's crust and naturally reacting with CO2 and seeing if we can't engineer processes that accelerate that natural uptake of CO2 in alkaline rich rocks. Uh, today we're going to focus specifically on direct air capture where we're using chemicals um, to react with CO2 directly in the atmosphere. Uh, and I should also mention that these two in particular, this one is biomass energy coupled to carbon capture and storage at the exhaust. So using biomass in order in a power plant in order to produce electricity. But in these two in particular, these are just the carbon capture components. And so they have to be coupled to permanent storage or reliable storage, for instance, like geologic storage in the earth uh, in order to be negative emissions. Uh, and then finally, there are these, uh, you know, biological uptake of CO2, afforestation and reforestation, and also enhanced um, carbon storage in soils. So what is direct air capture? So as I mentioned, using chemicals to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, 
So I'm going to list a little bit of the pros and then some of the cons. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, direct air capture has the potential, if coupled to geologic storage or reliable storage, the potential of being a negative emissions technology. Uh, it's a method for dealing with difficult to avoid emissions. So you can think about the transportation sector. You can think about industrial sector like cement and iron production. It doesn't require arable land, so you don't have to compete with the growth of food or energy crops. And it significantly requires less land um, than planting trees as well. So it's a more efficient process than simply uh, planting trees. But the cons are that the energy inputs of doing this are very significant. And although it's smaller in terms of land footprint, you know, for the equivalent carbon removal of a forest, it's still significant. And it really depends on the energy that you're coupling to the direct air capture plant that impacts what that land area uh, looks like. And first and foremost, direct air capture should never be seen as avoiding carbon in the first place. It's always going to be cheaper and easier to really capture CO2 at the source than the direct removal. So deep decarbonization should always be first and foremost. But as I mentioned, there's going to be some sectors that are very difficult to avoid. And we're also in a position where we don't have a choice anymore to meet climate goals. We do need to do carbon removal. And so the new portfolio is deep decarbonization, but it's going to have to include also um, removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. This is just an example uh, of the concentrations that we're dealing with in the atmosphere versus, say, a power plant. So this, this plot is to just give you an idea. This is the combined first and second laws of thermodynamics, which you can look at what the minimum work is or the energy required to do a given separation process. And what I'm showing here is that it, the, the x-axis is the CO2 concentration. On the right is a more concentrated stream of CO2. As I move to the left, I get to more and more dilute systems, all the way down to here, where we are at roughly 400 to 410 parts per million of CO2, which would be the atmosphere. And this minimum work isn't the real work. It's the minimum work. It's the thermodynamic minimum required energy input in order to do a given separation process. And what we're showing here is just a variety of um, purities of, of the CO2 ultimately, but if you're going to put the CO2 in a pipeline or a truck, then it needs to be compressed in a condensed form for transportation. So you're looking more at these kinds of purities, um, depending on how much you capture uh, from the stream, 50% to 90%, that minimum work is going to, is going to differ. But the, really the take home message here is that the more concentrated streams are easier to capture than these dilute streams like the atmosphere. And we can look at the energy just from a minimum work perspective. And on average, uh, the energy scales with dilution three times more energy to do direct air capture versus the combustion exhaust, say, of a coal fired power plant. And then from a, in that, you know, the energy requirements you can relate to the operating and maintenance cost of the process. And then the capital cost you can relate to how much contact area. So when you design your direct air capture plant, what does the surface area actually look like? If you want to capture the equivalent CO2 in the atmosphere as you would from the exhaust of, a, say, a, a power plant, then you have to have a surface area that's 300 times as greater um, because the concentration in the atmosphere is 300 times di more dilute than it is from the, uh, the exhaust of a power plant, for instance. That translates directly to increased capital expense. I wanted to show this because this is, in the U.S., we do have a success story of exhaust or point source capture. That's Petronova. Uh, this is a carbon capture pro project that's in Texas. And, uh, and it removes 1.4 million tons of CO2 from the, from the uh, exhaust of a coal-fired power plant every year. And, uh, and then that CO2 is used in enhanced oil recovery project where the CO2 is ultimately geologically stored in the earth. Uh, we know how to do this. The first patent was filed in 1930. We've actually been doing this CO2 separation from exhaust streams for a very long time. Mostly that CO2 is separated from, say, uh, refineries, and then it's used, for instance, in the food and beverage industry, and that's uh, a primary source of CO2 today for those industries. But the thing I wanted to show you here is the design of this unit. And so what you see is it's, it's tall and thin, and how 
a separation process works and I'm a chemical engineer by training. So this is something that we, we kind of do day in and day out is design these types of units for separation. But you have a gas stream coming in and then you have these different stages of separation. And in this contactor, you have uh, material, it's called packing material. And at the top, you have a liquid. The liquid that's going in has a chemical in it that reacts with CO2 in a selective way. And so the idea is, is that you are you know, drizzling or pumping that solvent down across the packing material in order to coat it evenly. And then you're bubbling the gas in from the bottom. And now what happens is as that gas is making intimate contact across all that surface area, across all that packing and through that liquid that has the chemistry, as it's rising and bubbling up, it's becoming cleaner and cleaner of CO2. And as that solvent is coming down, it's becoming more and more saturated in CO2. And so this is just one part of the process. You get that liquid out, it's saturated in CO2, and then you've got to put it in another unit that looks kind of similar, and then you have to regenerate it, which means you have to add heat to the system in order to make that solvent clean again so you can recycle it back through and do this over and over again. And then you do something with that CO2. You can use it, as I mentioned before, or you could do geologic storage, ultimately. Now, this is what we do to avoid carbon emissions to begin with. This is the kind of unit that you would put on the exhaust uh, stream of a power plant or maybe an industrial facility. And the point is, is that I want to show you that this looks very different from how we might do direct air capture. And there's a reason for that. And so back when I was saying before, that contact area. So if you're doing direct air capture, the contactor is going to look more like this. So not tall and thin. It's going to have this very large contact area in the front. And then it's going to be a thin bed in terms of the depth. And the reason for this is, again, because that CO2 is so dilute. So you need 300 times the contact area to capture the equivalent CO2. But this bed thickness has to be pretty... Um, thin, relatively speaking, and that's because it takes energy to push and bubble, say, or push the air through the depth of the bed. That's called pressure drop. And the deeper this bed is, the more energy it's going to take to push the air through. And so what we want to do is optimize. You want to be able to capture a lot of CO2, which would be achieved if you went deep into this bed, right? The deeper this goes, the more CO2 you capture. But you also want to minimize the costs of the energy that's required in terms of fan power. Uh, and, and air on average is, is at a velocity of about 1.5 meters per second. And so you don't have a lot of driving force. And so that's why you've got this characteristic design. Now, the packing material that goes into these units, it can be a structured packing. That's what you see here. That's similar to what's used in the Petronova project. So there's a little bit of a bridge of overlap there. Now, you're going to hear more about this kind of technology. Um, this is solid sorbents. We'll hear a little bit more uh, from Climeworks next. But solid sorbents look a lot like this. This honeycomb structure is a lot like what the catalytic converter in your automobile looks like. And you notice that the channels are on the order of millimeters. That's because you want to reduce the pressure drop across these materials, which would go into this contactor. And then what happens is on the walls of these, of these channels is where you have the chemistry. You have micro, meso, micro and mesoporous materials that have chemicals in them, like amines or nitrogen functionalized chemicals that selectively react with CO2. And to give you an idea of the surface area of those kinds of materials is one gram could have the surface area, say, of an entire football field. And so in just one gram, you can get a lot of chemistry. And the idea is, is that you, you decorate the walls of these channels with that chemistry. But that this kind of design allows you to minimize the energy required to push the gas through. And so one thing that you have to keep in mind, this goes back to that energy plot that I showed you, the minimum work plot, is it's, it, it takes a lot of energy to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. And here I say a power plant. We can think generally. The power plant doesn't have to be fossil-based. It can be geothermal, it could be nuclear, it could be renewable energy. But the point is it takes a lot of energy and ultimately a lot of power in order to actually do this. Um, on average, to capture 1 million tons of CO2 uh, from the atmosphere in a given year may require up to 500 megawatts of power. 
But again, this number is a range depending on what the nature of that power is, where it's coming from. This is um, more details of this. I'm just going to go through it briefly, but this is an Academy of Sciences report. Again, the charge of that report uh, was for the group to come up with a research agenda. And so what we did in chapter five, specifically focusing on uh, direct air capture is we looked at the two leading technologies today. So we looked at the liquid solvent based approach, which is what carbon engineering is doing. They're out of British Columbia. Um, and then we also took a, uh, an example of the solid sorbent based approach. So this could be thought of as what global thermostats doing, but also Climeworks. Um, and so what we wanted to do is get a breakdown of where, this is just capital here, but we wanted to get, and this is annualized, wanted to get an idea of where is the expense when you do this and how does it differ among the different technologies. And we wanted to do that because we wanted to understand where the dollar should go in terms of research and development. And so with the solid sorbents, a big part of the cost is actually making the micro mesoporous materials that decorate that honeycomb structure that I showed you. And so if we could think about research that could go into this to, in order to shrink this, to help advance the technology and reduce costs. And then in terms of the carbon engineering or the liquid solvent based approach, it's large pieces of equipment. We have an oxyfire kiln in that process, which means that you're burning natural gas in an oxygen environment to minimize carbon uh, emissions. It's easier to separate when it's in that, that um, atmosphere because you don't have nitrogen. Um, and also the contactor it's, itself is large and expensive in the packing material that goes into that. So these are just, you know, it's more about the actual equipment where this is more about the materials. And then finally, I'm just gonna, and on these last two slides in this introduction, I wanted to point your attention to another study that came out. This is a, from the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab led by Roger Eanes, and, uh, and this was published in January 2020. And what this study was, is it was a path, uh, a roadmap of how the state of California could get to carbon neutral by 2045. And again, chapter five, kind of funny overlap there. Um, but in chapter five, we focused on direct air capture. And again, it was specific to the state of California. And so in the state of California, what we wanted to do is harness some of the low carbon uh, energy potential that's there. And there's a lot of geothermal. And so again, to have the greatest impact as possible when you're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, it's important that you choose a low carbon energy resource. And so geothermal is an example of that. And so we looked a lot into the different geothermal opportunities. We saw a lot of potential in the salt sea. Um, the interesting part about that is that there's not a huge population density there. And the working fluid that's coming out of the earth isn't necessarily significant enough to actually generate power. And so we thought it would be a really good bridge uh, with direct air capture. And so what we show here is some costs. We separated it by the capex versus the opex. The dotted lines you see are an increase in cost. That increase in cost, when you see these dotted lines, were in regions where there weren't wells already drilled. And so what we have to think about is the capital investment and the operating costs associated with actually drilling new wells. Um, but in a lot of places, the wells already existed. And so for geothermal, you can see um, when we piggyback on that existing infrastructure in terms of the energy, we got all the way down to somewhere around $200 a ton uh, for, for, for direct air capture. And then you can also notice what we've done here is we overlaid it with potential sequestration opportunities in the state, anywhere from ultramafic rocks uh, to sedimentary reservoirs. And so in the uh, California study, we also looked at transportation costs and delivered costs to these different opportunities for geologic storage so that it's absolutely negative emissions technology. We also looked at waste heat. So looking at industrial facilities like refineries, cement plants and iron plant, and saying, you know, if there's waste heat available, could that be coupled uh, to direct air capture? Because again, the infrastructure already exists, so it helps to minimize the costs. So a little bit of uh, different things that we looked at, and I would just urge you to take a look um, at that study if you're interested in more details. And then I'll end here. Uh, this is just a, a series of um, different links with more information if you're interested. Thanks, Jen. Uh, if you do have questions for Jen, you can type them into that chat box or hold them until all three presentations are done. In the meantime, I'd like to turn things over to Christoph Beutler from Climeworks. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you very much, Jen. I'm going to
Share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, good, very good. So yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, uh, I would like to present in the following 10 minutes what Climeworks is currently up to and mainly link it to the big picture of you know why we really need to do this why we really need to scale this up as fast as possible. Um, but let me begin by reminding you of, of the, the climate pathways. So in order to make Paris, um, whether it's 1.5 or 2 is not really a lot of difference, I would suggest um, we need to get to a net zero point. And that means we have to reduce our emissions and also scale up the amount of, of negative emissions we need um, in factor of, of you know, gigatons per year as Jen already mentioned and um, we need to arrive at a global net negative uh, in, in, in around 2050 for the 1.5 degrees so we already know that we need to make this happen and we need to make this happen at quite a vast scale and this is why we founded Climeworks or more precisely Jan and Christoph our, our two founders uh, 10 years ago founded uh, the, the company um, we are now just over 100 full-time positions and have 14 plants across Europe. And we are the world's first company to actually supply CO2 to, to customers, atmospheric CO2. And uh, what you see here in, in, in the picture are, are the, the first generation uh, plants. So, you know, you have these modular collectors and uh, six of them fit into a 40 foot shipping container so you can basically um, you know, build various size plants relatively easily but also ship them around um, relatively easily. Uh, we only use renewable energy for, for our operations and we need about four-fifths of waste heat at around 100 degrees Celsius to desorb our filters and around one fifth of electricity to to run the fans and the auxiliaries and um, as Jen mentioned you know yes it, it's obviously it, it does need a power source and that's quite significant um, but you should really really use a, a low carbon or almost zero carbon power source and then you can achieve um, net efficiencies of 90 to 95 percent over a cradle to grave LCA so you can remove um, 900 to 950 kilos of CO2 um, net from the atmosphere. And if you move into fossil energy, obviously there's a point where you know this doesn't make sense anymore. So I'd like to stress uh, that first. So what you see in the picture is is our one of our first big plants that delivers CO2 th to the greenhouse you see in the background um, as a as a fertilizer. And that was quite exciting because that was that was the world's first customer. For, for direct air capture. Um, the world's second customer is, is are these guys, Coca-Cola HBC, um, with their mineral water brand Balsa. Mineral water is, is, is carbonated water that's quite popular over here in Europe. And uh, that's in stores right now. So so uh, just to show you that, you know, you, you can in niche markets, at least you can already have business cases and, and you can you can scale this but obviously not to the scales we need in the absence of, of, of policy but we like to you know be quick so we grab every opportunity we have this is our roadmap um we want and need to scale from niche markets or from smaller plants at several thousand tons per year to to bigger plants at you know a billion tons per year capacity and you know by doing this uh, we can bring the price down through due to uh, economies of scale mainly but also energy costs and so forth so so and and this is this is really key that we start early because you know I'll later show that the scales we will need require us to start scaling now otherwise we won't get there in time um and so you know with direct air capture you can basically do two things at the beginning i showed you this graph with the gray area so that's that's the mitigation part that's where we get need to get rid of emissions and you know that means you know we have to grab everything we have electrify transport you know electric cars and so forth but you know some technologies we currently don't know how to decarbonize directly for example aviation and we can you know decarbonize them indirectly 
by making fuels from CO2 from the atmosphere and renewable energy. And because you've taken the fuel from uh, the, the CO2, excuse me, from the air first, um, when you burn the fuel, it's emitted back into the atmosphere and thereby making it near carbon neutral. Obviously, you have some residual emissions within your process, which you then have to again offset by uh, negative emissions. But you know the message is so. Here's a technology that can do this, and and it can do this at scale. And this is this is really really important, um, which you know I want to illustrate by this slide. So. Let's say you want to um, decarbonize the EU transportation energy demand with biofuels, right? Um, what you see here is the surface area of the European uh, of, of Europe, basically, and the grey circle around it is the land area you would need to satisfy that demand, those seventeen thousand petajoule with corn biofuels. So we're running out of land um, to achieve the scales we need. Is the message? And um, I don't want to go into algae biofuel, but that's obviously another technology. And again, we need everything in the book. Um, but you know, if you do it with with direct air capture, and if you then use green hydrogen and combine it to hydrocarbon change, you can make a fuel on a very much smaller scale. So the calculation you see here includes just the surface area that we we would need to run such an operation, um, including. You know, not only the, the the surface area for the direct air capture plants, but also the, the PV panels, which is about ninety six percent thereabouts of, of of footprint. So yes, as Jen said, it is significant. It is it is quite a bit of land, but um, it is a possibility, and it's a lot smaller than the alternatives we have. Um, as Jen already outlined, you know, if you take the CO two out of the air and bury it into the ground, you have what's what's called a negative emission, um, and this is also something you can you can do with with direct air capture. And we have demonstrated this in in Iceland that this is a geothermal power plant at Helshedi, um, and in the in the bottom right corner we have a little demonstrator that that, that demonstrates the principle. And with our partners, we we are able to mineralize the CO two underground, which is the picture in the bottom right. So the CO two gets pumped underground and then mineralizes within two years, and it's 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 a really really safe uh, storage option, which we are really excited about and has been demonstrated. And and this year we'll build the the, the a big plant at this location. We're currently in the planning process to do this, and we already you know have started to sell the the, the negative emissions on. The, our web shop so uh, you, you know you can you can really act now and participate in, 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 in this pioneering work if you want to maybe I'll, I'll jump back to to the fuels bit um, you know unlike negative emissions you know most most products and materials that use co2 and, and bear in mind we need to replace these these uh, you know that are currently on a fossil basis by an atmospheric co2 basis to get to these net zero points and negative points uh, because as Jen said it's always cheaper to to replace it than to keep emitting and take it back out of the atmosphere we suggest you really need to think about you know where does your co2 come from because if you if you if the co2 is released in the atmosphere at the end of the life of the product if you take a fossil co2 and and ccs it from a point source you have an, a, a net reduction but you also have a delayed emission and therefore you know and if you if you think further ahead to a point where we have to get to net zero we have to start switching off point sources so then you know the atmosphere uh, really does become the only sustainable supply we do have okay back to to the negative emissions um there you know the, the same story unfolds um you know you can obviously plant trees and and they store co2 from the atmosphere within themselves and you absolutely should do this again we need a portfolio we need everything we have but you know again we will very likely or we already know that we will run out of land area with the scales that are, are needed to achieve the climate goals so again with direct air capture and again including the surface area here in this calculation on the right hand side um, for pv panels we can make this really really small so so this this is roughly the surface area of 20 percent of iceland can could remove eight uh, gigatons per year so eight billion uh, tons per year and if you use geothermal you can make that smaller again so so this is really in terms of space um a, a really good option it does that doesn't put pressure on on arable 
land. Um, I want to leave you with with one final uh, thought. So as I've outlined, you know, we foresee a, a direct air capture cost curve that goes towards 100 over the next 10 years. Um, but in order to get there, we have to scale and, and also, you know, we really need the scale to be able to take up the cost increase from biomass based approaches or mitigation will also get more expensive. Abatement costs will, will get higher. Um, the more you know, we need to utilize this in in the in the kind of run up to to a net zero 2050. So, you know, while it's, direct air capture is really expensive today compared to afforestation, you know, we already know that we will run out out of land, which will then economically speaking make it more expensive. So, we need to keep this is to me is a very important mechanism that we should keep in mind when we're thinking about policies um, to to design such a transition to. Uh, a circular, sustainable, atmospheric uh, carbon economy. That's it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. And over to Shahak or David, I guess. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, let's turn things over to Shahak now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can you folks uh, see it? Great. Okay, well, thanks again for this invitation uh, and the opportunity to talk about our technology. I'm Sahag Boskin, the co-founder of Ferdox. Uh, it's a company that we founded based on my work at MIT on electrostring carbon capture, electrostring adsorption, and I'll talk a bit about this uh, technology today. So, uh, Professor Wilcox and uh, Chris did a great job of giving a great overview of carbon capture and the problems associated. But one thing I wanted to emphasize is that carbon capture is indeed a multi-scale problem. So it could span anywhere in, con uh, in concentrations from 0.04% uh, or 400 ppm in air um, all the way to 10 to 15% or 40% in some industrial processes. And in flow rates, it could be anywhere between 400 tons per hour in the 500 megawatt power plant, as you can see here, um, or uh, it could be as low as uh, 18 liters or 20 liters per second uh, in a car tailpipe exhaust, or in a megaton power uh, in a megaton plant where uh, CO2 is being captured from air. It's on the order of uh, tens of thousands of cubic meters per second. So. The problem is indeed, uh, it's, uh, it's not simple. It's, you cannot have a panacea solution to tackle all streams of all concentrations and flow rates. And incumbent technologies uh, use mainly thermal gradients or pressure gradients, like the amine absorption, which is a very mature technology and is currently the workhorse of uh, carbon capture from power plants. Professor Wilcox had a few slides on this. Petronova is a great example of this in the United States and Texas, where capture occurs in an absorber that operates at low temperature uh, compared to the desorber, which operates at a higher temperature and releases the pure CO2. You also have membrane-driven technology, membrane technologies, which are driven by pressure gradients, where CO2 uh, in feed air is pressurized and uh, the separation is achieved through membranes. This is useful for some niche applications. We also have temperature and pressure swing, which I believe is the technology that Climework uses. This is mainly solid sorbents that rely on uh, the shift in temperature and pressure to achieve capture and release. So at MIT, what we tried to look into was using electricity or uh, potential difference shifts uh, to achieve capture and release at uh, constant temperature and pressure, uh, ambient temperature and pressure. For that, we looked into material that have a binary affinity to CO2 depending on their charge state. So the core of the technology is a simple battery like the ones in your phone that could be charged and discharged. And the material of this battery is such that upon its charge state, it has high affinity to carbon dioxide, and it can bind to it from any concentration, including at 400 ppm in air. And in its discharge state, the system loses its affinity to CO2 completely, 
So CO2 is released, and this could be released into any carrier stream, including pure CO2. And you can see here in this uh, graph, uh, as you one thing to focus on this is that as you apply charge and discharge to uh, the battery, or as you charge and discharge the battery, the concentration of the CO2 captured goes up, and uh, or the pressure in the sealed system fluctuates, uh, showing that the CO2 is being captured and released. And this binary effect can be toggled, as you can see here, uh, by the charge-discharge effect. So now, they say a picture is worth 1,000 words. Uh, I will show you here an animation that is running at 30 frames per second, so there will be a lot of information. You can imagine in a swing system, just like in a pressure or thermal swing, you can have two beds operating in parallel. Now, now focusing on one bed here, you can have the, uh, you'll see the electrochemical cell, which is comprised of the active electrodes, which do the capture and release, the electrolyte separators, and the counter electrode to balance the charge. Now, a number of these electrochemical cells could be stacked to trace gas flow channels. And feed could be brought into this gas flow channels that is comprised of some con uh, number of inerts and some concentration of CO2. And the electrodes are activated by applying a charge. Now, all these active sites uh, on the electrode, which have been electrochemically activated, have improved affinity to CO2 and can react with it and capture the CO2 until the electrode is saturated. So now you can see at the process level that the feed is coming in at some concentration of CO2 and only pure nitrogen is leaving while the CO2 is trapped on the electrodes until the electrodes are saturated. And when the polarity is reversed, uh, the CO2 is released from these electrodes because as the uh, electrodes are discharged, the affinity of these active sites to CO2 is brought to zero. So CO2 is released from the electrodes or the contactor into uh, the downstream process. Now, just like in the animation, uh, we at MIT, we built this uh, bench scale prototype, which can achieve the capture of CO2 at 10%. This was made for mobile applications. Uh, it's a crude prototype, but as you can see here, uh, when inlet gas was brought in at 10%, uh, the outlet uh, the concentration of CO2 dropped to zero, and it maintained a very low concentration until the electrodes were saturated and uh, the concentration of CO2 rose again. So now, in terms of applications, uh, my, uh, the previous speakers talked about a number of downstream applications, and the versatility of our technology lends itself to be integrated into any of these applications, um, such as low concentration systems where CO2 is captured from air, and used for downstream and CO2 enrichment in uh, greenhouses where uh, high concentrations of CO2 helps um, accelerate plant growth, or it could be used for uh, capturing CO2 from indoor atmospheres, sealed buildings, or enclosed spaces like submarines or space capsules um, or spaceships uh, to maintain uh, low metabolic concentrations of CO2. Other high concentration applications include industrial or power plant point source capture, as well as mobile capture. And because of the chemistry of our technology, uh, where it's mainly acid and base interaction, this could be used for the removal of other acid gases like SOX and NOx. And this is of interest for shipping industries and other uh, industries where uh, there's heavy regulation in emissions. So now you can imagine uh, two or more of these boxes operating in parallel where the upstream CO2 could come in from either power plants, uh, mobile sources, or even air. And because of the uh, chemistry and the uh, binary affinity of the electrodes to CO2, the efficiency and the thermodynamics of the capture process is made relatively constant as the same. So you can imagine one box uh, operating in the capture mode where the box is being charged and CO2 is getting trapped onto the electrodes, where the next box over or the next unit 
is operating in the release mode where the current is reversed and CO2 is released for any number of downstream applications such as greenhouse enrichment, um, greenhouse CO2 enrichment or uh, enhanced oil recovery or like uh, Chris talked about, conversion into fuels and value-added chemicals. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would like to open the floor to any questions you may have. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Zaha. Uh, at this point, if you do have questions, you can open up the chat window uh, in Zoom and type your questions right in there. We've accumulated a, a few questions already uh, that I will start directing to our presenters. Uh, but feel free to add questions as they occur to you. So first, there was a, a really important question that came up uh, that we should take a minute or two to clarify. Uh, when Christoph was talking about using captured carbon dioxide in beverages or greenhouses, one of the participants asked whether that sort of direct air capture and use uh, just puts carbon right back in the air. Uh, so, uh, Jen, I know you've done a lot of thinking about this recently. Could you say briefly uh, exactly what it takes for direct air capture to count as carbon removal or as a negative emissions technology? Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, what, what the person asked, I saw that question too, and absolutely. So if, if CO2 is taken from the atmosphere and it's used in a way that just re-emits it back, uh, it doesn't count as a negative emissions technology. And so an example of that would be food and beverage, even taking CO2 and converting it to fuels. But that's also why Christoph mentioned the concept of circular, right? And so... Um, so, so some of these things are kind of in a circular way, like if you were to take CO2 and convert it to a fuel and you need hydrogen to do that, you just have to really make sure that all of the pieces that you're putting into there, whether it's a you know, carbon intensity of the supply chain and carbon intensity of the energy that goes into making hydrogen, that goes into reacting CO2 with hydrogen, that goes into taking CO2 out of the air, all of the carbon intensities of each of those streams, materials and energy, have to be taken into account and that'll tell you um, for instance if it's a fuel you know how that footprint is different from conventional fuels today and what their footprints are but that isn't negative um, but if you take co2 from air and you put it underground or you mineralize it with an alkalinity source like permanently remove it from the atmosphere that counts as negative because you've taken it out of the pool in the atmosphere that's been accumulating. Um, if you do carbon capture on an exhaust, just as Sahag mentioned it too, it, it, that's avoiding the carbon emissions to begin with, or it's delaying them as, as Christoph talked, if we, if we capture them. Um, and so all of that is just reducing, it's doing deep decarbonization, but it's very different than directly taking the CO2 that's in the atmosphere today, pulling it out permanently and having an impact that affects climate means that we need to do that on the gigaton scale. Right. Uh, we had a, a couple of follow-up questions there about uh, the case where you're taking captured carbon and embedding it in something like uh, concrete. Right. Is that going to count as carbon removal? If the CO2 is coming from the atmosphere and you embed it in something like concrete, so what, what you need to do to do that is the CO2 needs to react with an alkalinity source to form like a synthetic aggregate. Normally we make concrete with sand and gravel and cement, but if you replace that sand and gravel with a synthetic aggregate by mineralizing CO2 with an alkalinity source, then yes, that would constitute negative, but then you have to ask yourself how long does that uh, mineralized product of CO2 last in that form? you would have to calcine it, you'd have to heat it. If it's magnesium carbonate, maybe 600 degrees C, if it's calcium, maybe 900 degrees C, in order to re-evolve the CO2 back into the atmosphere. So mineralization of CO2 is a wonderful way to permanently remove it. Okay, great. Um, 
we had a couple of sort of technical questions related to price. So I'll throw two of these out here and uh, let any of the presenters who want address them. So one is about the learning rate. Uh, as sort of installed capacity for direct air capture grows, um, uh, it's anticipated, as Christoph showed in his graph, that the overall cost is going to fall. Uh, so one way to put this question is, what's the capacity, installed capacity needed uh, for uh, to reach $100 a ton? Um, and a sort of follow-up question there, uh, what do you think is the absolute, absolute price floor for direct air capture? How low could the cost get? Ben, would you want to start and I'll take over? Sure, I can start. Um, so in the California study, we looked at, uh, there, there's two types, you know, from that, I'm not, that's not my area, but I'll talk a little bit about what I learned from being in that group and what, what was looked at. Um, but it's a matter of the, the, the rate in which you learn, too. And, uh, and I think it's also technology specific. And so, for instance, and I know um, Christoph will be able to answer this better for his system, but if you look at the carbon engineering type of system, those plants, again, the, the, the expense is associated with a large piece of equipment that's required. And so what it means is it's economically feasible for them to do plants that are on the order of a million tons of CO2 removal per year. And so, but what that means is it's expensive to build one of those plants. And so how many are you going to get to build in one year? You know, that's a lot of capital. And versus like if you look at Climeworks or even Global Thermostat and maybe even uh, Sahak's process at Burdocks, you know, those are potentially on a smaller scale, right? Like you look at the CarbFix program, it's like what, 900 tons of CO2 removal per year. And so it, it, it's on a very different scale, which means that you could potentially build lots of those kinds of opportunities. And what it means is every time you build one, you learn, right? And, and so that means that you have lots of opportunities to learn. Whereas the big scale, it's like you build one, you learn, but then like you have to raise the money to build another one, it might take time. It's, it's the learning is gonna be slower, I think, with the larger capital investments versus the smaller. And so the rate of growth of each of those is probably gonna change based upon that. But, you know, one is gonna be fast learning, but at the same time, that fast learning is also coupled to smaller scale projects, you know, where the other one are big projects, slow learning. So which one is better? Which one's going to win? I don't know. I mean, I personally think that how do we get to $100 a ton? I think we need to get direct air capture on the order of gigatons. Can it be below $100 a ton? I don't see that. I don't see that, but we can kind of cheat a little bit too. And that's what we did in our California study. It's like, well, if you've got a geothermal plant or even uh, a study that we've done recently, if you have nuclear, if you have waste heat, it's like you're piggybacking on something that's already been invested in and already exists today. So somebody already built it, somebody already did it. So you can save costs in, in coupling to those opportunities. And so, you know, but if you're building a standalone brand new plant, greenfield, everything's new, it's ex it's expensive. And I think it's going to be really hard to get down to a hundred dollars a ton. And I, but I can certainly see uh, potentially getting there as we get from a thousand kiloton or a, a, a thousand tons of CO2 removal today to somehow six orders of magnitude greater by mid-century. That's what we need to do. Stop, so hard. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll expand on this. Thank you, Jen. That was that was uh, very very good, and and Jen is absolutely right. So, you know, the reason why we go for the modular design is because we think in this way we can learn fast. You know, carbon engineering when they build their their million ton plant, um, you know, the price will come down by quite a big margin. Hopefully, you know, so far they only have demonstrated, but you know, this way we can really, really learn quickly. And maybe to, to expand on what Jen was saying, there, there are three, I think, things that, that matter the most. So one is, you know, your your technology learning will make it cheaper. So, you know, the, the, the efficiency gains from, from technology improvement, that's one big, big factor that includes obviously the sorbents. The other factor is, um, you know, the, the production mechanism. So, you know, 
currently we are producing by hand in Switzerland, which is one of the most uh, expensive countries to produce in, in the world. And as we move into mass production, you know, you can, uh, there will be price benefits via economies of scale. Um, and the second one to keep in mind is obviously as time goes on, we really hope that renewable energy becomes cheaper because that's that's an, another factor. But even at today's prices, um, we can foresee where, where this is likely to go. And with this, I would, you know, agree with Jen, you know, we foresee 100 as a floor cost. Some scientists are claiming uh, 50 or even less. You know, some of the direct air capture companies uh, also are claiming less. But, you know, I think if you, if you look into it, the way we did, we, we would be confident in, in, in saying, okay, we can, we can get to around 100, but we don't see 50. Thanks. Thank so you, Chris. Uh, yeah, I'd like to add a bit on this. And uh, Professor Wolfgang and Chris covered uh, this very well. On the CapEx side, uh, I'd agree with uh, the fact that uh, as we scale, uh, the modular systems which scale somewhat linearly um, have a much uh, easier learning curve, a much cheaper one, which later on could be uh, scaled up and the price chased down by economies of scale. That's something we're trying to work on here at Burdox. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that as we start exploring this innovative or novel ways of uh, tackling the carbon dioxide molecule and toggling that affinity either by temperature, uh, pressure, or electrochemical systems like ours, we will get much closer and closer to that uh, chemical or thermodynamic minimum of the bond formation and breaking and we should be able to utilize that to bring the opex down as well now in terms of uh, integration into existing infrastructure like professor wilcox said for uh, thermal heat or waste uh, waste heat from power plants and so on that's one way of uh, utilizing existing infrastructure the other way is that now we have the emergence of energy storage and microgrid energy storage systems and microgrids where uh, and also grid arbitrage as renewable electricity sources are being integrated into an existing old grid that is mainly uh, fossil dependent. Uh, here you can have this grid arbitrage combination of uh, bringing in the CO2 component where uh, depending on the cost of electricity at any given time and the cost of CO2 that is brought upon by regulation you can decide what is economical, uh, whether you want to capture CO2 or store your energy. And uh, all these different technologies that are uh, dependent on these uh, waste heat or waste electricity could benefit from this situation or, and could also help uh, indirectly grow these grids and energy storage systems. Great, thank you. Uh, I want to pivot for a moment at least to policy. Uh, we had a couple of policy questions here about what sorts of policy could uh, help to grow direct air capture capacity in the near term. Uh, one question was about whether uh, or the, the contrast between what you might think of as pol push policies like R&D from um, uh, or as recommended by the NAS panel that Jen mentioned. Uh, in contrast to what you might call pull policies, like the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Uh, and someone else mentioned or asked about the potential role of international carbon markets. Uh, would any of the speakers like to uh, comment on what kinds of policies they think would be most appropriate at this stage for incentivizing direct air capture? Happy to, to start. Um, I would give a general answer, then maybe everybody can think about which policies would be suitable. So, you know, what we have here is a situation where we have technologies that, that are earlier stage and, um, you know, so that they are still expensive. So, and you have companies behind them who have to go through through the value of death, so to speak. And if we if we then set up policies like, you know, the 45Q at, at $50 per ton, where, you know, some say we can, we can go to, or this might be the floor cost, cost these policies do not trigger immediate investment in, in, in what we do. So, so I would more think think of it more in, in 
terms of policies that would maybe allow us um, a very high price per ton, on, you know, a current price per ton, but you can only fund, uh, uh, let's say, 10,000 tons or 100,000 tons of that price. And the next, uh, I don't know, 100 or a million, 100,000 or a million tons, you would have to, you know, get funded at, I don't know, 300, 200 per ton. So, so some mechanism that, that forces the technologies to, to, as they move along in time, to bring down the price and then the, the most efficient ones win. I think that is from a technology perspective the best way to go and it's also from an economic perspective um, quite safe because you, you initially your capital costs for this funding are not that high because you're funding only small volumes. So that would be my my chosen pathway. I'll add to that too. Uh, um, so with the Academy of Sciences report that was a uh, you know, the charge again was to establish a research agenda. So where should the uh, dollars go in terms of research and development funding um, through the government in the United States, like National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, like where should those those funds go? And, and the point of that, if, if you take a look, if you're interested, each chapter, each of those negative emissions technologies, we talked about where funding needed to go. And it turns out that it's a broad distribution. There's technologies like Climeworks, Global Thermostat, um, Carbon Engineering that are ready for deployment today at scale. And so they don't, they don't necessarily need R&D funding to help get their technology ready for deployment. It's ready. Is it expensive today? Sure, but that's why we need to deploy more. That's why we need to do more. And something like 45Q, like today, it's actually pretty low. And, and Christoph and I have had this conversation before. It's kind of reversed. It should be high today and go low as we deploy and as we increase our productivity. And as we learn more, as we learn more, we expect prices to come down. And so we won't have to depend, hopefully, on subsidies and tax credits as much in the future as we do today. Like they need to be high in the early days. Um, and so, but, but those kinds of things like low carbon fuel standard, like 45Q, they exist for technologies that are ready to be deployed on an interesting scale today. And, uh, but for, like, so some of the work that Sahag is doing, like, there's still some fundamental exciting research to be done too. And so in that space, it's like, that's where I see kind of, you know, the research charge that, or the charge that we were given as an Academy of Sciences committee. It's like, those are two separate buckets. And, and the technological readiness level of all the various direct air capture opportunities are different. And so we need, we actually need all of it. Yes my thoughts thanks we are running out of time but i would like to try to squeeze in a, a combination of a few more questions here about the implications for power use uh, so there's a range of things here about the uh, the overall energy requirements um, of direct air capture uh, questions about what it would take in terms of renewable energy uh, to Produce this questions about what happens when, uh, say, Climeworks outgrows waste heat. What other sources of low-grade heat they might use? Uh, so, any quick comments from any of the three presenters about um, uh, power use implications, one way or another? Sure, um, I'll, I'll be quick. So, I think in general. Um, you know, what, whatever you do, uh, make sure as a policymaker that you uh, design appropriate LCAs and these should be cradle to grave because this allows you to measure what's really happening. So this is the first um, really, really important step. Um, and then the question about what happens if Climeworks outgrows waste heat's a perfect, very good question. We will have to make our own renewable energy or create our own renewable energy, and that's why in these calculations and these footprint calculations I've I've just shown, we include the footprint that for for the PV panels. We always calculate PV panels currently on on the footprint needed to run these systems, and so that is about ninety six to ninety eight percent of the total footprint. Um, so yeah, we the short answer is you have to. You know, use additional renewable energy, your own. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll just add one quick, quick comment because I, I agree with all of that. But that is also, it's, it's uh, the, the answer is technology specific, right? And so it turns out like the carbon engineering and the, the global thermostat and the climate works, it's, it's, it's a, they're very thermally driven today, right? And, and less to the extent of, of electricity required. It's, it's a lot of thermal energy. But like maybe Sahag can say something because one of the benefits of his process is that it can be 100% electricity. And so the other piece is, is that, you know, we would like to have renewables coupled to direct air capture to have the greatest and the most significant impact on removal. Uh, but they're intermittent. And so if a technology is meant to run 24 seven, but the sun's only shining 40% of the time, how do you couple those, right? And so the, there is, I mean, some exciting stuff with looking at approaches that are electrochemical or even electro swing, and that could potentially, you know, turn off and on and cycle with, with renewables. So how That's right. Just, yeah. Yes. So just uh, that, that was a very thorough description. Uh, just to add on that, uh, we have looked into multiple ways on doing this and integrating this into a grid. So we would uh, have, for instance, one uh, one example. You have the algae uh, biofuel growth. Uh, this is something Chris alluded to. You can have uh, cheap off-peak electricity doing carbon capture at night and doing uh, release and recovering some of that energy during the day. So here you combine the energy storage uh, aspect of the technology with the carbon capture and used cheaper electricity uh, to supply to, uh, CO2 to your biofuel. So overall, there are all these different topologies now uh, with uh, being able to do things either thermally or uh, elect electrically, you can have multiple topologies in which uh, your, the system could be integrated into different types of grids or different types of infrastructure that already exists and minimize the cost of uh, building infrastructure itself. Okay, with apologies to all the great questions that we did not have time to answer, uh, that is all the time we have for today. So thanks to our presenters, Jen Wilcox, Christoph Beutler, and Tahag Voskian. Uh, thanks to all of you for your interest and discussion. If you'd like to learn more about carbon removal or watch this webinar or others in the series, head on over to the Institute's website. Uh, you can get there at carbonremoval.info. And you can also get updates on upcoming webinars by signing up for our mailing list uh, or by following us on Twitter at carbonremovalau. Thank you very much.